Hello everyone and welcome to the third in our mini-series of uh, lectures on qualitative evidence synthesis. Uh, my name is Andrew Booth, I'm from Shah at the University of Sheffield and today I'm privileged to be sharing with you a published example of a qualitative evidence synthesis um, that I uh, undertook uh, with uh, a master's in public health student here in Sheffield uh, and which has led to further work with um, two other master's students. So um, what are we going to do in this particular session? Um, well, we're going to um, introduce the steps by which any qualitative synthesis is undertaken. Although there are specifics of the method that I'll be describing, um, generically the stages are the same regardless of which of the many methods um, you use. Um, and I'll refer back to the um, schema from Ruth Garside uh, that we introduced in uh, uh, the second in this series um, that shows the, the various component activities within a synthesis. And then we'll conclude um, uh, having uh, demonstrated uh, these steps in relation to uh, published reviews um, with some conclusions and further developments. So um, here's the uh, uh, schema that uh, I referred to from Ruth Garside's um, uh, thesis. Uh, you'll see that the uh, stages are described on the left-hand side. Um, it's important to recognize that they are not uh, necessarily linear. In many cases, they're iterative. They involve going back, for example, back to the uh, texts um, but um, this iterative nature provides uh, a challenge uh, when one thinks of the need to uh, demonstrate uh, a systematic approach and indeed to, to document the review. So please be aware of the tension between uh, making the method flexible in, in order to improve its value and uh, the challenges of uh, trying to describe that in a way that uh, uh, appears uh, organized and, and, and logical. So uh, starting with the uh, first of the uh, stages identified by Ruth, um, in the review that I'm going to be describing, um, our objective was to uh, synthesize uh, both published and unpublished qualitative research, looking at how women perceived uh, giving birth in a, a hospital or health facility in rural Kenya. And this was building on an existing uh, qualitative synthesis that had been conducted for the World Health Organization that looked across multiple countries to look at the barriers uh, faced by uh, mothers in low and middle income countries. Uh, and so uh, what uh, our review did was offer a unique opportunity to compare uh, a review that with data that is just derived from Kenya with what we would call a multi-context review um, that covered uh, multiple lower and middle income countries. And uh, when you uh, look at the trade-off um, between the two reviews, um, that although um, all uh, studies were eligible, um, the synthesis by Boren um, only uh, uh, included two studies from rural Kenya um, and um, there were two more um, uh, Kenyan studies from, from urban settings. Uh, so four studies in all, um, uh, only two of which um, were eligible within our, um, uh, our particular review. So that was developing the research question. Um, we did a scoping exercise. We built on the existing reviews, and this is a good uh, technique in order to construct a search strategy. We used the review by Boren and uh, uh, another uh, review. Um, and we were looking for um, published qualitative studies. Um, on the back of the scoping exercise, we developed our inclusion and exclusion criteria, um, uh, which allowed us to uh, focus on a particular um, uh, characteristics, such as these studies had to be published in English. They could include the uh, grey literature, um, and um, um, this uh, opened up to us um, uh, a source that hadn't really been mined um, by Boren, which is the uh, thesis literature. Um, and obviously, theses are a good source of um, 
uh, qualitative research because um, that they can be uh, uh, that qualitative research can be conducted within the time frame of a, a thesis or a dissertation. So uh, moving on, uh, we uh, did the, the search proper, if you like. Uh, we searched multiple um, databases. Uh, here are some of those medical databases, psychological databases, nursing and allied health databases, general databases, and the popline uh, population health database. Uh, we used a combination of free text and subject headings. Um, and we also use qualitative filters that uh, aim to uh, uh, improve the retrieval of the results uh, by uh, eliminating uh, overtly quantitative studies and uh, leaving uh, candidate qualitative studies for us to review. And uh, uh, both myself and uh, 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 Sarang, uh, who was the um, uh, student, um, we followed up the reference lists of eligible studies and uh, I conducted citation searches in order to track down irrelevant uh, papers. Um, and we identified uh, some uh, grey literature. So um, the first task that we had was to sift through this uh, wealth of uh, retrieved documents. Even though we were only searching for one country, we had over 2,000 uh, eligible um, uh, or potentially eligible citations. Uh, 288 of those were duplicates, so we started by removing those. Um, and then uh, the large proportion uh, was uh, excluded at the title and abstract stage. Uh, that left 58 articles that we read fully, and then uh, from that we ended up with 16 uh, studies that met the inclusion criteria. And those eligible studies were independently assessed for quality um, by both of us, and we used the uh, CASP um, uh, qualitative uh, checklist. And that process is captured in the PRISMA flowchart. Um, in the previous um, lecture in this series, we uh, mentioned that uh, there are reporting guidelines, draft guidelines uh, called NTREC, which are based on the PRISMA guidelines. Uh, but either of these reporting standards in, uh, requires um, presentation of this particular flowchart, which shows your decision process in uh, uh, eliminating duplicates, eliminating articles at title and abstract, and eliminating at full text. Moving on to the analysis and synthesis. Um, the preliminary synthesis um, involved extraction of data uh, to uh, a framework on an Excel spreadsheet. We used some earlier work um, uh, done by Sarang um, uh, for her uh, uh, for her assignment. Um, we then uh, d derived a, a, a th thematic analysis um, of factors um, affecting uh, women giving birth in rural Kenya. Um, we used a best fit framework synthesis method, um, which combines descriptive and interpretive techniques. In other words, it starts um, by mapping the data to a framework, and any themes that are not uh, contained within the framework um, are um, uh, derived from the, the data uh, so that you end up, if you like, with uh, an improved framework. Um, in doing this process, we were able to um, spot um, um, the uh, various um, themes and uh, 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 meta themes, if you like, that ran through the data. This is just an extract of the uh, published article where you see the, the different themes and the supporting data from the studies, including verbatim quotations to uh, illustrate and exemplify the, the uh, findings. And uh, we noticed from this data that um, there was something uh, missing in terms of our framework that very important was the idea of a time dimension. So for example, women would contemplate their decision, but could well review that decision under the, the, the uh, uh, emergency situation of giving birth in a hurry. So the, the plan factors that influence their decision early on could um, be overtaken, if you like, by um, the requirements of the emergency. 
and we um, identified a framework that would help us to deal with that particular aspect of the data from a comparable country, Nigeria, um, which um, illustrates this uh, concept of a best fit framework. It doesn't have to be perfect in the sense of being an exact match. It needs to be good enough to be a starting point for um, data extraction and analysis. So when it came to dissemination, uh, we targeted um, the journal midwifery, uh, given the uh, topic area. Um, but we identified the possibility for comparison between the multi-context QES done by Boren for the WHO and our own Kenyan uh, QES. And in fact, we combined um, this presentation um, with uh, a similar Nigerian study um, done by uh, two other master's students and uh, produced a methodological reflection in the Journal of Advanced Nursing. And the Nigerian paper, um, equivalent to the Kenyan paper, is uh, currently um, uh, going through the stages of uh, editorial review. So, uh, what are some of the points to be considered throughout the process according to uh, Garside's template? Um, well, um, the importance of multiple viewpoints. Um, th these viewpoints were from the students who knew the context better and myself as a, a methodological tutor. Um, it's important to create opportunities to um, uh, identify dissonance. So this means um, stepping away from the, the sort of hierarchy or the power dynamic, if you like, to uh, entertain all possible explanations of the data, to look at it through um, different uh, eyes and, and then through different uh, preconceptions, to uh, then reflect on our own influence as a, a sort of uh, medium for the, the interpretation. So how was the interpretation affected by our own prior beliefs? and uh, did, did that impact on the synthesis itself. Um, the uh, importance of the audit trail documenting at each stage, and this became a challenge with uh, different uh, individuals involved at different stages of the process. Um, ongoing consultation, which we mainly achieved through Skype meetings, and uh, revisiting the review purpose. So, for example, um, the Nigerian uh, study uh, led to development of a model called CRIB, uh, which is going to be the subject of a, a further paper. So um, where does the field of qualitative evidence synthesis lie at the moment? Well, we're going to see a continuation of methods for exploring the role of context in helping us to understand how interventions work, uh, methods for engaging with theory, and particularly uh, in the use of logic models to explain what's called program theory, in other words, explanations for how um, interventions work. Um, Methods for integrating quantitative and qualitative data, um, these, these still uh, remain a priority and we suspect that uh, primary qualitative research will give us ideas on uh, how this can be done within a synthesis context. Um, the uh, underexplored area of dissemination bias, so how do um, uh, conventions around publishing and, and uh, expectations of researchers around uh, getting published uh, determine the, the outputs of uh, qualitative research and what impact does that have on the synthesis. Uh, for example, we've identified the phenomenon of uh, truncation bias, the fact that um, theses may be um, only presented in a truncated form um, uh, within journal articles and, and so uh, the challenge there is to identify uh, what data, if any, has been lost. Um, and to explore other biases and particularly to look at the use of reflexivity statements. Uh, you'll bear that within qualitative research, um, uh, the, the primary researcher is required to be reflexive about um, the influence of themselves as a researcher on uh, uh, the, their interpretation of the data. And then this uh, translates equally for uh, those involved in qualitative synthesis. And the resource that I shared with you in lecture two um, uh, from the EPOC group on uh, um, a template for um, reviews, some uh, nice examples of um, reflexivity statements for qualitative synthesis. 
So uh, in conclusion, uh, both this lecture and the, uh, the series of three that I've um, been privileged to present, uh, metasynthesis provides a way to integrate qualitative studies in a way that, that acknowledges um, that they do have a, 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 a aggregative and mapping function, but particularly value lies in uh, adding to interpretation or configuration as it's variously expressed. Um, that metasynthesis shares some of the requirements of qualitative research in itself, um, that it's not just a form of literature review, but it must be sensitive to some of the concerns like the influence of the researcher, the, the need to be iterative, the need to recognize context and to explore theory. And as we've seen, uh, particularly illustrated at the end of the second lecture, there are ongoing debates with regards to the place of metasynthesis and its underlying uh, epistemological, ethical and political considerations. So thank you for your attention. Um, just to conclude by um, uh, taking you through some of the um, references. Um, these uh, are also at the end of the uh, previous slide. There's reference here to uh, Ruth's uh, um, thesis, which um, supplied the, the templates that we followed with our published study. Um, some of the uh, texts that we've uh, referenced along the way, including a reference to our own published study in the journal Midbury. Uh, and uh, finally here, um, some of the uh, debate that we uh, rehearsed in lecture two. Uh, around the place of qualitative synthesis and some of the outstanding uh, uh, challenges uh, to be um, pursued and explored. So thank you for your attention. I hope you've enjoyed this uh, lecture uh, uh, series and uh, look forward to engaging with you again at a subsequent occasion.